to YouTube. It'll start streaming in a minute. And yeah, I'm, I knew there was a reason I didn't record this earlier. Uh, okay, there we go. Thank you. Now, uh, I guess we decided we would do this in, in order that I should introduce uh, Richard Raymer, the prime minister of our club, who will <laughs> uh, uh, take it over and we'll work our, our way around to Christian eventually. Okay. Uh, yeah, there. well, it, it, this isn't exactly a meeting of, you know, the general meeting, which is going to happen a week from Wednesday. Uh, so we're not going to go through, you know, our usual, you know, routine of uh, checking, you know, club business and, and announcements and so forth. But you need to I'm announce gonna, the fair. Uh, yes, uh, we are in the middle of the fair. Uh, we had four forays last weekend, and we're going to have four forays this coming weekend, and we'll have speakers every night this week, uh, and that constitutes our virtual uh, fungus fair for 2022, uh, as opposed to one that is indoors, which are all being canceled, including MSSFs in Orinda. So uh, we decided this would be a safer venue uh, than, than what's available, given the, the prevalence of the Omicron variant of the COVID you know, virus. Uh, so Christian has been so generous with his time and effort in assembling all of the speakers for this week, and he's going to be uh, speaker number one, and Phil Carpenter is going to introduce him. What am I doing, Greg? Well... Thank wow. you, Richard. You're welcome. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, actually, it's, it's, it's my absolute pleasure to, to introduce this guy. So um, I had the pleasure of meeting him when he first came to Santa Cruz as a student at UCSC. And I was immediately impressed with his knowledge. And since then, it has become just <laughs> amazing how much this young man knows. Uh, I, I say young man. It was interesting yesterday at one of our uh, our forays that we led, a, a man came up to me and said, well, I was really excited to come to this foray because I wanted to meet Christian Swartz and I was expecting this older guy. And here's this young man. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, you know, he's an incredibly accomplished uh, person. I've had the personal pleasure of of working with him, being on many forays with him when they were writing their book, uh, teaching classes together. So uh, with that, uh, Christian, please take it away. If Christian is here. He's I here. am here. Yeah, oh, hi everybody. <laughs> uh, thanks for that uh, introduction, Phil. Um, it has been my pleasure to know Phil and actually the whole Fungus Federation. Um, wait, can you... I just got a request to start my video. I'm assuming you can see me now. Uh, I don't see you. Not yet. No. That's why I asked. <laughs> Do you see me now? No, you still got me on the screen. And you don't want right. to... Yeah, let me... Uh... Oh, remove spotlight. There we go. There, there you we go. go. There you go. This is much now better now. looking. <laughs> now um, you have on the screen. <laughs> so it has been uh, my pleasure to know Phil since day one in Santa Cruz. He was uh, the very first member of the Federation that I met because I brought a uh, bully down from campus to uh, the meeting at the Harvey West Scout House. And I didn't know what it was. And Phil took it from my hands and took a big old bite out of it, which really shocked me because I didn't know anything about mushroom safety at the time. And uh, he told me it was bitter. And so it was Calabolitis Martia, Ben's bitter bolete. And uh, then I met all the rest of you, Richard and Dan and uh, Margaret and Debbie and all the rest of you. So I have had the pleasure of being um, a member of the Fed since very early on. And it's sad that we missed the fair last year. And I'm glad that we're doing this instead this year to sort of fill in the gap that I think for a lot of Santa Cruz, that's like a major cultural event that happens in January to look forward to. Um, Everyone expects to go to the Loudon Nelson and to see hundreds of mushrooms on display, but uh, the Myco Blitz is what we're doing instead this year. So for those of you who don't already know, we're doing a version of collecting mushrooms by uh, virtually aggregating the mushrooms you find. If you go out in the woods and if you make observations of fungi on iNaturalist, 
they will be automatically aggregated into this project called the Santa Cruz uh, Fungus Fair Myco Blitz. And so we'll sort of have a friendly little competition, a little project to see uh, how many species can be found in our county in this little window of time that we think of as a mushroom holiday, the fungus fair. And uh, we'll also sort of see how many, how many species we can get. So it does uh, give us a little bit of data to work on um, for folks who are assembling the mycoflora of Santa Cruz. Um, that's something I'll talk a little bit about in a second here, but I encourage you to participate in that. If you don't already have the iNaturalist app, uh, download it for your phone, make an, uh, an account and get out in the woods and just observe mushrooms. That's all you have to do. You don't have to join a project. You don't have to follow any protocol. Just get out there and see what you can find. I think David Kurtz says there's about 4,000 observations of mushrooms already on our MycoBlitz project just for the past week. Um, Dan, did you happen to look at the species count sometime recently? I can't hear Dan. Dan, you're uh, No, I haven't. I haven't, but I'm pretty sure it's it's it was it, nearing it's 500. Growing. Yeah, it's probably nearing 500. Huh? That's pretty amazing. Um, so, anyways, that's the the Micro Blitz that's happening on iNaturalist right now. I do encourage you to to contribute to it. It's easy and it's fun. But tonight, I'm not going to be talking about Santa Cruz. I am going to be one of my favorite uh, topics in fungi, actually, um, I'm going to be talking about the biogeography of fungi and specifically island biogeography. Um, so hopefully you can see the presentation. Can everyone see that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, cool. Yep. So the title is Sky Islands and Dry Islands, the Biogeography of Macro Fungi. And I'm going to be walking you through um, not just fungi from the Channel Island archipelago, for those of you who don't know this word, an archipelago is an island chain. And the Channel Islands of California, which some of you have probably been out to Catalina or possibly Santa Cruz or Santa Rosa, these are uh, California's very own archipelago. And I'll be giving you a little bit of background about the archipelago itself, uh, as well as what fungi we found out there and contrasting that with a different sort of island and then sort of drawing some conclusions or not really conclusions, perhaps just asking more questions about what that means for our understanding of fungal biogeography in general. So to start with, uh, when we think about the biogeography of islands, and just to, to define our terms here, biogeography is a pretty self-explanatory word. It comes from two roots, bio, life, uh, living creatures, and geography is the study of land um, or maps. So this is the discipline of science, the discipline within biology that focuses on where the geographic uh, extents of different species are, where they live um, <laughs> and why they live there. Um, and that's sort of what biogeography aims to investigate. So islands, as you might expect, are a classic laboratory for investigating these questions because they are so extreme in their discreteness. They are separate from other land. So you can ask almost uh, questions that have been standardized for one variable. You can say, okay, this is a piece of land very far away from any neighboring land. What effect does that have on the diversity of species there? And what sort of filters does that distance uh, represent for organisms that can't cross the barrier in between the mainland and the island? So some fundamentals of the, uh, the study of island biogeography. In general, we think that as the size of an island goes up, the diversity of the island goes up. So a bigger island, all other things being equal, will have more species present on it than a small island. Likewise, the more remote that island is, uh, the less diversity it will have. The closer it is to a mainland, the more diversity it will have. And that has to do with dispersal from the mainland. So one of the ways that islands get their creatures is by the chance dispersal of creatures from the mainland to the island. For birds, they're flying. For um, plants, seeds may be floating on the wind. For fungi, it's spores that are dispersing across the ocean. Um, for other organisms, it's a bit more mysterious. How do salamanders disperse from the mainland to an island? It turns out that one of the main hypotheses for how some, of, some salamander dispersal has occurred is through big storms on the mainland washing rafts of logs out from the forest um, down creeks and out into the ocean. And eventually, if they are lucky enough to 
float to an island and land on a beach that the salamander can disperse off of. Um, that's one of the ways that we think that uh, organisms like that have dispersed. Um, but that just goes to show you how random, how stochastic, and how chaotic and uh, based on chance these dispersal events can be. Endemism. This is a word that refers to, this is a, a major theme in biogeography, is the idea of endemism. Endemism just means an organism that lives in a particular geography or a particular area and nowhere else. So this is a word that's frequently misused because everything is endemic to somewhere. We're all endemic to Earth. As far as we know, there's no life outside of our biosphere. Um, folks, if you're not muted, just make sure you're muted. I'm hearing some background noise from somewhere. Um, but endemism from the perspective of islands has to do with island endemism. So we ask questions about whether or not there are organisms that live only on the island where we discover them. And this is really common for birds. There are uh, island endemic birds, there are island endemic plants, there are island endemic uh, salamanders, there are island endemic spiders, snails, as you'll see. But the question that we have to ask as mushroomers is whether or not there are island endemic fungi. Um, and depending on which island you're talking about, the answer is definitely yes. Um, but we don't actually know the answer yet for California's Channel Islands, for the California archipelago. We don't have good solid evidence that there are endemic fungi uh, to any of the Channel Islands. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then the question of disjunct, that is just a word meaning separation. Um, how long have the land masses been disjunct? Because islands were not necessarily always islands. As we'll see in the case of the Channel Islands Archipelago of California, uh, of California um, those islands were actually quite a bit larger when sea levels were lower, and they were quite a bit closer to the mainland, practically connected. So they weren't as isolated um, of islands as they currently appear to be. So we're gonna back up now and talk about not necessarily island biogeography, but one of the earliest theories in microbial biogeography. So this has to do with bacteria, this has to do with fungi. For a long time, people thought that because their spores are so small and so effective at dispersing on the wind, that probably every species was more or less everywhere. And the only difference that could account for uh, different communities of mushrooms in different places was that the environment was different. Different trees, different uh, temperature regimes, different rainfall. Um, if only those conditions would change, you could find virtually any mushroom anywhere. But we don't really believe that anymore. So Kabir P.A. is a researcher from Stanford um, who worked with Tom Bruns for a long time at UC Berkeley. And a lot of his research, his academic research, uh, is about island uh, biogeography of fungi using disjunct pine groves in the midst of meadow settings, acting as sort of pseudo islands. So not a typical concept of an island, but from a fungus's perspective, um, having one pine tree a uh, hundred meters or a, a kilometer away from the nearest pine forest is an island. And so a lot of what Kabir does is sampling the soil around these pine islands um, and asking whether or not those communities follow the same predictions as classic island biogeography would, would presume. Um, and not only PA, but many other people have investigated whether or not this original microbial biogeographic hypothesis uh, bears, bears out once you examine the real world. And the answer is certainly not. We don't find that all fungi are, are everywhere. Um, it kind of sounds absurd to us now, but for a long time, people more or less believe this. Um, there is actually quite a bit of structure, geographic structure, in where we find different species, which is not surprising, shouldn't surprise us. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. Some of it is biological, so their host plants don't live in a certain place, which you could say is the environment, but there's also historical reasons. Um, land masses that were connected in deep history or that were separate in deep history um, are part of the reason that we see the patterns of all sorts of organismal biogeography, but it, it goes for fungi as well. So the California um, archipelago or the Channel Islands as it's also known, I'll use those two terms interchangeably, were in the deep past, um, a paleopelago. Um, so this is not the islands we're familiar with today. They were actually one big island called Santa Rosa. 
And as sea levels rose in recent, well, relatively recent geologic time, um, that flooded some of the lower lying places on Santa Rosa Island and created this sort of island chain that we see in the northern part of the Channel Islands archipelago. I'll show you a map of the entire archipelago in just a second here, but the Santa Rosa chunk of it is the four northern islands that I'm going to be focusing on today. So overall, the entire Channel Islands uh, archipelago is about 119 kilometers in extent. Um, and the area of land that it accounts for, so all the islands are of different size, but if you add them all together, you get about 1300 square kilometers. And just to contrast how big or how small that really is, um, the North Island of, of New Zealand is about 70,000 square kilometers. So it's much, much, much bigger, New Zealand's North Island is, than the Santa Cruz or the California Channel Islands, even all smashed together. Um, if I remember correctly, Santa Cruz County, which you're all probably really familiar with, is about double the land area of all of the Channel Islands. So about half the county is how much land you would have to cover um, if you if you wanted to survey all of the Channel Islands uh, thoroughly. Okay, so here's a map that shows the sort of position of the ancient Santa Rosa. So that's outlined in blue down at the bottom. So the minus 100 meter sea level shoreline and minus 120 meter sea level shoreline are shown in different shades of blue. So you can see there, there were actually a massive island that was only about seven kilometers offshore at one point um, at the lowest extent of, of sea level. But now they're quite a ways offshore. They're still visible, easily visible from the mainland when you're driving down Highway 101. Um, you can look to your west and out by where the oil rigs are, you will see to the north of them, uh, these islands in the distance. So this is uh, down in Southern California, Southern Central California or Northern Southern California, depending on how you account it. Um, but these are the four Northern islands that I'm focusing on today, San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz. And actually I won't be focusing on Anacapa, but rather San Nicolas, which I'll show you the position of in just a second. Um, so San Nicolas is that one down at the bottom of the screen. Um, Anacapa is actually a very small member of the Northern Four, which constitute the Channel Islands National Park. The other islands are not actually part of a national park system. Two of them are owned by the Navy, San, San Nicolas and San Clemente. And then Catalina is um, sort of a, a strange island where there's actually permanent residences. People live out there. And there's, you know, two cities that have major ports. Uh, the two cities are Two Harbors and Avalon. Um, but there are preserves and sort of, um, you know, public land jurisdictions on all of the islands that are not owned by the Navy. So I'll be actually talking a little bit about San Nicolas, which is down at the bottom of the screen. And just to orient you, San Nicolas is the furthest offshore of all of the Channel Islands, just about tied with San Miguel. But because San Miguel has that nearby chain of islands, um, it's actually, relatively speaking, closer to a link to the mainland than San Nicolas is. San Nicolas is much more isolated off on its own. There's not an obvious hop, skip and a jump stepping stone for organisms to arrive there. Okay, so like I just said, there's two ways of grouping up the Channel Islands um, or two main groups rather. There's the Northern group, which were connected at one point into Santa Rosa and then the Southern group, San Clemente Island is actually down off of uh, the San Diego coast. And then Catalina, I believe, is in Los Angeles County. All of these islands, though, have a high degree of plant endemism. So there's that word that I mentioned earlier. Um, there are many plants that live on the Channel Islands and nowhere else. So there's been enough time and enough isolation that many of the plants that arrived to the islands from the mainland have diverged evolutionarily from their ancestors and now constitute separate species that don't resemble um, those on the mainland particularly closely anymore. Um, in pre-colonial times, there was a long history of inhabitation of the Channel Islands by indigenous folks, including members of the Chumash tribe. Um, and they would take tomols is the name of the boats they would dig out of redwood logs and paddle them out there, which is an incredible feat. Um, the, the channel is not always easy to cross especially if you're in a big, blunt-faced, heavy canoe, but they did it. Um, and they turns out that they played 
probably a fairly important role in the character of not only plants, but animals that are, are found there now. The recent history of human interaction with the Channel Islands, unfortunately, includes some pretty intense disturbances. Um, so after um, Europeans arrived in California, one of the first things they did on the Channel Islands was to introduce grazing animals, namely cattle, goats, sheep, and in some cases, pigs as well. And this was a, a big catastrophe for the Channel Islands. The grazing activity of these animals, in some cases, nearly decimated the entire vegetational landscape of some of the islands. So I'll be talking about San Nicolas in a little bit, but San Nicolas was virtually sterilized. There was almost no green plant life left after um, a combination of drought and grazing took its toll. Um, the other major disturbance that humans have had on the Channel Islands in recent times is military activity. So San Clemente and San Nicolas are both uh, Navy owned and San Clemente at least is an active bombing range, both underwater and on land. So planes drop bombs on the island throughout the year, every year, and submarines bomb the underwater parts, parts of the island throughout the year, every year. In my opinion, this is virtually um, one of the greatest sins we can, we can be doing is to take sort of a precious jewel of biodiversity and use it for bombing. Um, it seems really squandering sort of one of the most unique and, and beautiful uh, aspects of California's natural history, but such is the world we live in. Some of the important plants from a fungal perspective that are found on the Channel Islands are those that are ectomycorrhizal. So for those of you who have been in the world of mushrooms for a long time, know that this is one of the most critical relationships to understand um, between fungi and plants, because it structures where you're going to find any particular species of mushroom that you're looking for. Um, this is the association between a woody plant host and a fungus underground in which the plant exchanges sugar that it produces via photosynthesis uh, for resources from the fungus, which absorbs nutrients like phosphorus, nitrogen, water from the soil. So some of the main ones on the Channel Islands that are really important are tori pine and bishop pine. I'll show you a picture of bishop pines, or sorry, tori pines in just a second, um, as well as some manzanitas. There are some manzanitas that are endemic to the Channel Islands, which is to say that they don't occur on the mainland at all. The only place to find these manzanitas is on one of the islands. Uh, there's also some oak species that only live on the Channel Islands. Quercus tomentella is um, the island live oak, and it probably has endemic fungi that live with it, but we have not yet gathered enough evidence to say that for sure. We haven't found what those endemic associates are of these um, island endemic hosts. So that's one of the major research goals of anyone who goes out to the Channel Islands to look for fungi. So on the left, there's a picture of me standing under one of these uh, endemic island oaks, that's Quercus tomentella, with a little bit of a bishop pine in the foreground. And on the right, you see a sprig of manzanita, and that's one of the island endemic manzanitas. Um, for those of you who don't know, manzanitas are a shrub, very hard wood, very beautiful red trunks um, in the blueberry family. And they're extremely diverse in California, over 100 species, many of which are narrow endemics to different habitats. Some of them are found um, in the foothills of the Sierra. We have, I, I believe, four endemic manzanitas just in Santa Cruz County. So it's a great genus of plants to learn as a Californian naturalist. And they do have fungi that associate with them. Some of you who were on my walk at um, the Sand Hills on Sunday saw Lexinum manzaniti, one of the boletes that grows only with uh, madrone and manzanita. But this leaves us with the question, when we're assembling lists of, of fungi out on the islands, how do we know which ones are native and which ones are not? And the answer is really not clear. Um, we know that pigs, sheep, and bison, which all occur, or at one time occurred on the Channel Islands, those were not native. But there's this funny case where some of the goats that were introduced to San Clemente Island actually um, became so inbred that they looked really different from all mainland goats. Um, and they were named as their own subspecies, the San Clemente goat. 
And for a while, there was an effort to protect them, even though they were basically just glorified inbred livestock. Um, so it really depends, um, or it goes to show you how much our own perceptions um, matter in, in what we determine to be native, what scales, um, how much human involvement um, we can tolerate when we consider an, an organism to be native to a particular environment. And this is particularly important for the Channel Islands. This is not just a rhetorical example. I'm not just being um, provocative by showing you this goat, because as it turns out, uh, the Channel Islands foxes present us with an interesting conundrum when we're, we're talking about native versus non-native. Um, black rats were introduced to the Channel Islands in the 1800s by the accidental crash of the SS Winfield Scott, a big sailing ship on the islands. And that introduced another plague to the islands um, that decimated a lot of the seabirds that were nesting there. Thankfully, in many cases, those rats were eradicated um, due to some intensive trapping efforts. Um, and for those of you who know about the Farallon Islands off San Francisco, they're about to finally, after years of debate, um, employ rodenticide to try and get rats off of the Farallon Islands to allow seabird recovery. Um, but there were also mammoths on the Channel Islands in prehistory. This is something a lot of people are not aware of, but there was a, on the left there, you see this pygmy mammoth, Mammuthus exilis. That was the uh, Channel Islands species of endemic mammoth. It's hard to imagine this, but at one time in the Pleistocene, there were mammoths roaming across the landscape in the West, and there was even um, a species that lived on the Channel Islands. Perhaps they swam across the seven kilometer channel. There's some evidence that, that elephants might have been able to swim that far, but their fossils are still occasionally found out there. And then there's currently endemic mammals. So the island fox, if you ever take a, uh, a visit to Santa Cruz Island, you'll see these tiny little cat-like foxes. They're only about this big um, and they behave very docile. They're, they're not scared of people. They'll wander around your campsite in between your legs. They're really cute. Um, here's a picture of me trying to take a picture of a mushroom, but this fox wouldn't let me get close to it. So I had to wait my turn. Um, you can see just how little they are. But the reason that these foxes are uh, an interesting case of what we consider native is that they were probably brought over by Native Americans in their canoes as more or less pets to keep their campsites uh, and their, their living arrangements free of small rodents. Um, so these are sort of like the cats that you keep in a garden to get rid of gophers or rats. And it's hypothesized at least that some of the Southern islands, especially these foxes were not originally found there until Native Americans dispersed them there. Okay, but these questions about island biogeography, these hypotheses of island biogeography um, are not very easy to test in the real world because there is no perfect test tube island, um, even in New Zealand. So this is actually um, a string of New Zealand words or uh, Tong, not Tongan, Samoan words that I don't remember. Um, sorry, not Samoan, Maori. I'm mixing up my Polynesian islands. Um, Maori words that I no longer remember the translation of, um, but the recency with which New Zealand was exposed as a landmass um, provides us, for example, uh, one of the ways that we can that uh, one of the ways we can get sort of a test tube view of an island that has a short geologic history, as opposed to some of the larger islands like Borneo, that although it is an island, it's so large and so old that it virtually has um, the quality of a mainland, the character of a mainland. It doesn't behave in the same way as a tiny little island like Hawaii or like um, Easter Island. So every island has a different story and none of them will give you all of these sort of controlled variables that you need to, um, that you need to have in order to test a biogeographic theory perfectly. So if we're going to understand macrofungal biogeography on islands, it's going to require us to visit many different islands, tell each of their stories differently, and then compare and contrast them. And eventually we'll get a sense of what fungi respond to, what matters to them um, in terms of dispersal, in terms of survival. So now I'm gonna walk you through some of these islands. Uh, these Northern islands um, have a more Northern influence than the mainland at the same latitude. 
So if you cross from Santa Cruz Island to Ventura, uh, the Santa Cruz Island climate is wetter and cooler than the coast. So you can be at the same latitude, but the island influence is one of coolness and dampness. So it feels more like you're at a northern latitude than uh, you would expect at that, that point in Southern California. There's a relatively limited set of, of plant hosts for fungi to associate with compared to the mainland. They have had some serious disturbance to contend with. So what we're seeing there is a, a recovering landscape after uh, grazing animals have, in many cases, really done quite a bit of damage, a lot of erosion and even outright near extinction of some of the plants that, that used to live there. But what we also see is that there is some release from competition. So on the mainland, there's a lot of fungi and that might mean that there's more intense competition between them. And it might mean that some species that are rare on the mainland are sort of released from that competitive environment and they become more common than we normally see them. So here's a quick map of Santa Cruz Island. It's actually the largest island by far. It's got a central valley. It's big enough to have an interior. It's got two big ridges um, and it's got sort of um, some difficult to access areas on both, both sides, but the center of the island is where most of the observations come from because there's actually a UC reserve out there. Um, the UC uh, system has a field station that I have stayed at to do research there. And this is what it looks like when you are up on the Pelican Bay Trail that anyone can access. So if you take a trip out there on Island Packers Ferry, this is the trail that you'll be walking on. It's beautiful. You look out over the harbor. You're surrounded by oaks and pines. Um, and it's, a, it's the most diverse island for fungi by far. Santa Rosa Island is its neighbor, and it's very hard to access, as you can tell by this observation map. You can really only get to the northwest side of it, or sorry, the northeast side of it. Everything else is quite rugged, quite difficult to access. Um, but this is some of the most special habitat on Santa Rosa Island is this grove of Torrey Pines, uh, right where you land. So you can take a boat out to Santa Rosa as well and even camp out there. Anyone can go. Um, and these Torrey Pines are one of the rarest conifers in all of um, the Northern Hemisphere. And they probably have endemic mushrooms that grow specifically with them. And this is one of the best patches of Torrey Pines found anywhere in the world. There's a few patches in San Diego and a few patches in the islands off of Mexico, and that's it. There are no other Torrey Pines anywhere else. So this is one of the main habitats of interest on Santa Rosa Island. San Miguel, I only went to San Miguel for the first time recently. It's a very small island comparatively, and it's very windswept. Um, it is, ex you know, on a, on a nice day, the wind is only going 20 miles an hour. Um, on a bad day, the wind might be 40 miles an hour all day for three weeks. So it's a difficult place for anything to live, especially plants, and that means especially fungi. Fungi have a hard time making a living in a place where there's no plants and a sort of a constant drying wind. There's no trees on San Miguel Island. There is not a tree to speak of. Here's what it looks like. So this is during the summer when everything is gray and dry, um, not a lot going on here from a plant perspective and certainly not much going on in the middle of the summer from a mushroom perspective, but there are small canyons that stay wet and there's perennial seepages. And this is the area where you start to find mushrooms on the decaying vegetation under the endemic island loco weeds and golden bushes. Um, any, any of the decaying shrubs um, that accumulate leaf litter can be a place where you'll find mushrooms. So what does the academic research on the microflora of the Channel Islands look like? Well, there have been a very few cursory trips. Historically, there haven't been many people who've been out there. They have produced relatively few specimens. There are virtually no accessible photos for the longest time until in the past 10 or 20 years, community scientists, people who are not professionals necessarily, have started making trips out and doing focused documentation of what they're seeing. I know that I think Joanne Schwartz is in the uh, meeting tonight. And Joanne is one of the main people who's been doing this. She's been going out to Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa Island, and documenting, vouchering, photographing, uploading to Mushroom Observer. Um, so we have people like Joanne to thank for the recent boom in records of macrofungi from the Channel Islands. So almost all records that we have of mushrooms from the Channel Islands have come in the past 20 years, and really in the past five or 10. 
because of people using iNaturalist and other community science platforms to record and to share what they're seeing. So what do we know now? Well, this is the iNaturalist project that I've set up to aggregate people's observations um, from across the archipelago. At the moment, it stands at about 1,600 observations, which is not very much compared to the mainland. But the reason is because it's hard to get out there. You can't always guarantee access to the islands. Um, sometimes the, the ocean conditions are too choppy and your boat is canceled. Um, a few of the islands you simply can't go to at all because they're owned by the Navy and there's no public access. Um, even the islands that you can go to, only a few of them allow camping and they usually only allow camping in the summer, which is not mushroom season. So it's hard to get records from the Channel Islands, which means that if you ever go there in the winter as a member of the general public, your observations of mushrooms there count doubly, triply, quadruply valuable compared to any observation of a mushroom you could make on the mainland. Each and every observation that anyone makes on the Channel Islands is treasure from a research perspective. We need people who visit the Channel Islands to take this, this sort of mission um, as a sort of detector and um, sharer of what you see. So I want you to, to feel that that's sort of your responsibility, your duty as someone who visits the Channel Islands is to witness what lives there and to share it with the rest of us because it takes really all of our efforts to get a good picture of what's happening out there. Um, 241 species. Now, that is only the set of species that are currently represented on iNaturalist. I'm actually working on an article for publication that I have incorporated a few other um, data sources into, and the actual total count is much closer to 400. So there's probably about 400 known taxa of macro fungi from the Channel Islands, but that doesn't begin to cover how many actually exist there. That is highly limited by our inability to survey the islands most of the year and most of the time. So here's two different charts showing each one of the uh, islands, each one of the eight islands. So as you can see, Santa Cruz Island is leading in the number of species, but it is second to Catalina Island in the number of observations because people live on Catalina Island full time. So it's much easier to make observations on Catalina year round. No one lives on Santa Cruz Island full time except for the reserve staff. So it's much harder for, for us to get a, a clear picture of what's there. And then you can see on some of the smallest islands, there are virtually no species known and virtually no observations made, fewer than 20 observations for some of these islands. So you really can make a huge impact on our knowledge of the California archipelago if you go out there and just share with us what you've seen. All right, so this is a mushroom that probably a lot of you are familiar with from the mainland. This is Merasmus placatilis, a beautiful species, and it's found in many, many habitats on the mainland. Um, it's one of the most generalist litter decomposers of, of any species in California, but it's also found on the island. And what's cool about the forms of Merasmus on the island is that they come in some different color schemes than we're used to seeing on the mainland. There's an orange version that's quite common on the islands, as well as a pastel pink version. And I've never seen this on the mainland. In fact, I've only ever seen it once on the islands. Um, and the question becomes, does this coloration, this color scheme have something to do with the restricted gene flow that we expect for populations on the islands? The less they interbreed with their, their neighbors on the mainland, the more sort of um, inbred, so to speak, the more distinctive their genetic pool becomes, the more divergent from the normal forms we, we see on the mainland. So this is an example of the kind of research that we might want to do on the Channel Islands. Are the genetic uh, consequences of isolation visible in things like the color schemes of fungi that we see there, or in the size of the spores of the fungi that we see there, um, or perhaps the size of the fruit body, or perhaps the fruiting season. All of these variables are factors that we expect to change in response to being isolated on an island for a long time. Uh, this is a, a fungus probably no one recognizes because it's not very common in our area. And in fact, I don't think I've ever seen it in Santa Cruz County. And it's uh, quite a bit more common in Southern California, but no one really knew about it 
until it was first found on the Channel Islands. So this was from my very first visit to the Channel Islands in 2012. Um, and I found this mushroom. I had no idea what it was. It took a few years to figure it out. We got a DNA sequence and it's a uh, leucoinosophy. Um, and once we figured it out and knew how to recognize it, it turns out that it's actually quite common in Southern California. But one of the advantages of paying close attention to everything on the islands from a floristic perspective is that it can lead you a trail back to things that you actually uh, were ignoring or overlooking on the mainland. So for a while, this was a contender for an island endemic species until we realized it's actually all over the mainland. We just had been ignoring it. So there's this sort of psychological effect that happens on the islands, which is that you see everything with new eyes again for the first time because everything might be an endemic, everything might be special. Um, and in that sense, it's a really sort of rejuvenating sensation. You sort of feel like you're discovering uh, mushrooms all over again for the first time. Oh, so, so now I'm gonna talk about San Nicolas Island a little bit. This is the Navy owned island that is the, it's a very small island, very distant from the mainland. And it's one of the most negatively impacted by human activities of all the islands. So I was given a, an opportunity to visit San Nicolas Island in early 2019, which I wasn't terribly excited about because it had such a terrible history of grazing and bombing. Um, but I was amazed after that wet season, what we found there. So there are rare and endemic snails that live there, which is why I was invited to come out. It is thought that these snails primarily eat mushrooms, primarily eat fungi as their main diet. And so the Navy biologists wanted to know more about what fungi the snails might be eating. So here's the endemic snail that lives out on San Nicolas Island, Micrariontia feralis, Micrarionta feralis. Um, this is what the island looks like when it hasn't rained. It's a desert. It's absolutely bare sand with a few patches of vegetation. But if it has rained, it looks very different. Um, most of what we found there, oops, this is out of order, We've managed to find about 110 species in four days that were primarily came from four groups, agaricus, entolomas, puffballs, and satharellas. Um, this might make sense to you if you're um, a experienced mushroom hunter because these all share some similarities. They have large spores, and many of them anyways, that have thick walls, and they are more ornamented, textured, and pigmented than other groups of fungi which probably means that their spores are more UV resistant. And because they're a little bit larger on average, they probably are more able to um, establish or colonize in places where there's not a lot of, of resources for a germinating mycelium. Inosobes are one of the few ectomycorrhizal groups that we found on San Nicolas Island because willows have dispersed, um, I don't know if any of you know willow seeds, they float on the air very easily long distances. And so willows have been able to colonize San Nicolas Island really effectively, and inosobes are one of their main mycorrhizal partners. So this is one of the main uh, groups of ectomycorrhizal fungi that, that occur out there. Um, but we also found that there's some ecological innovations that happen on the island. So there's no wood, no true wood that is native to San Nicolas Island. There are no trees to speak of. Um, they don't even really have shrubs. They have a few small woody shrubs, but they're not even like a manzanita. They're you know, lower than your waist. Um, so some, some classes of substrate that you normally find mushrooms on um, or hosts that you expect to find on the mainland are very hard to come by or even absent completely. So it's hard to find wood. I know that sounds strange, um, but there's, there's virtually no wood to decompose on a lot of the island's area. So fungi that disperse there that depend on wood um, are faced with the prospect of either adapting to this lack of their, their needed substrate or else they die, they go extinct. Um, this is what the island looks like when it has rain. So this plant that you see fields and fields of is actually in the sunflower family, but it's a sunflower that can get you know taller than your head. It's a perennial shrub called Leptosony, giant coreopsis. It looks kind of like a Dr. Seuss plant, it's got these big pom-poms of leaves and big bright yellow flowers. And because there's very little wood on this island, the oyster mushrooms that live on this island, um, this is not an oyster mushroom, but uh, this is another wood decay species that has adapted to decay the wood, so to speak. It's not real wood, but the trunks of these sunflowers. So 
in the lack of the lack of the presence of wood, some of the fungi have discovered uh, or innovated ways to digest the sort of pulpy cellulose trunks of these leptosini, these giant sunflower bushes. Um, this is the oyster mushroom that I wanted to show you. So it's the only Pleurotus, the only oyster mushroom that we found on San Nicolas Island, and it grows on the trunks of the decaying sunflower bushes. It appears to be an undescribed species. We don't exactly know what its relationship is to a few New Zealand species. Um, it may be very similar to uh, Pleurotus parsonsii, which grows on flax trees, which are also not true wood in New Zealand. Um, but it may be an island endemic as well. We're not sure yet. Um, I brought a few of these oysters back to Justin Pierce, who some of you know, who's a mushroom cultivator, and he managed to bring this oyster mushroom into cultivation in the labs at Far West Fungi. And this is what it looked like when they fruited. So I went down there about two or three months after I took him the first sample, and he had fruited it on sterilized uh, grain and sawdust. And it produced um, very small fruit bodies, just like what we saw in nature not the big oyster mushrooms you expect to see growing on willow and oak, but very small and very peachy, almost uh, pink and yellow tones. Um, funny enough, I took a few of these fruit bodies down to Lupulo, um, where I was meeting with Phil one afternoon, and I handed them to Phil, and Phil took a big bite of them and said they tasted kind of bitter and farinaceous and not very good. So thanks to Phil, we now know that this is probably not um, a particularly delicious edible oyster mushroom. But it is curious to know that there is potentially an endemic oyster mushrooms mushroom on the, the uh, Channel Islands. Um, however, we still have to distinguish it uh, for sure from the New Zealand relative, as well as determining whether or not it occurs on the few coastal patches of mainland sunflowers. Here's um, not an endemic, but it's an example of a fungus that has switched its host association um, as compared to the mainland as to the island. So this is a rhizopogon, which any of you who are familiar with rhizopogon know that they're associated with pine trees, but that is not the case for this species. This is rhizopogon oop, mengii, um, and it grows with manzanita, arctostaphylos, one of the very few rhizopogons that does not grow with pine. And that's probably another example of a species that had to figure out a way to adapt or to die. Um, rather than go extinct, it just switched its host association to a different plant than it normally associates with. Um, that's just another picture of the, I don't know why that's there. <laughs> so I've talked quite a bit now about wet islands. So these are islands of land in the middle of the ocean, but they are not the only kind of island from a macrofungal perspective. Mushrooms um, can be isolated by salt water, but they can also be isolated by big patches of desert, big patches of dry, arid landscape that aren't hospitable for their growth. So these are what I call dry islands, or sorry, uh, sky islands. Um, dry islands are the ones in the ocean, sky islands are the ones in the mountains of the desert southwest. So sky islands um, are not water bound, they're actually circ um, circumscribed by desert or by arid land. And they are sort of marked by their elevational and temperature um, gradient from the desert floor to the high mountain peaks. So the scale of the island has to do with the subject that you care about. From a fungal perspective, a mountain in the middle of the desert um, is an island. And fungi are concerned um, not only with uh, the water that's around them, but with uh, the organisms that support their life. So the trees or the shrubs that form mycorrhizal connections with fungus. Here's a picture of the Chiricahua Mountains of, of Southeast Arizona, which is where I've done a lot of research recently. Down at the bottom of the valley here, or the, the, the desert floor, it's about 4,000 feet. Up at the top of those mountains, it's about 10,000, almost 11,000 feet. So it's a huge and very sudden rise um, of these mountains out of the, the surrounding area, which means that from a mushroom's perspective, if you call these mountains home, it's not easy to get to the next patch of appropriate habitat. It may be tens or hundreds of kilometers away. So here's just a map comparing um, two mushroom projects that I have for different sky island patches in the desert southwest. 
um, the Santa Catalina Mountains near Tucson and the Chiricahua Mountains, which are closer to the Mexican border in extreme Southeast Arizona. Um, as you can see, there's quite a bit of intervening space between these two mountain ranges. And it's not just any intervening space. It's like, if you see that pale patch near Wilcox, um, that is hot, dry desert salt flats, um, 110 degrees in the summer, not a place you wanna be if you're a Boli or a Cortinarius or an Amanita, not a place you can survive. If you're going to disperse from one of these islands, uh, sky islands to another one of these sky islands, it's going to be because your spore floated on the air between them. Or as we'll see, not necessarily because you reached a new island, but because um, there used to be more extensive habitat connecting these places and you are simply hanging on. Um, these, these sky islands may represent refuges of an ancient habitat that no longer exists in the intervening areas anymore. So here's a range map um, of an organism. I'm not gonna tell you what organism it is at first. I'm gonna give you a few seconds to guess what group of organisms this represents. It's one genus of organisms. So you can see there's a lot of it very widely dispersed across the east. You can see there's some in the Rocky Mountains, but it's a little bit more fragmented. You can see there's some going down the mountain ranges into Mexico, and you can see there's quite a bit in California, but there's big gaps in the Great Plains of the Midwest, as well as in the Basin and Range province of Nevada and Utah. So this actually is a range map of a plant family near and dear to our hearts. These are the oaks. This is the genus Quercus. And this distribution affects a lot of fungal diversity and distribution as well. So I'm gonna show you an example of a fungus that follows oak trees. Um, so I want you to keep in mind these two big gaps, these two big breaks in the oak distribution. So this is the range map of a mushroom that follows oaks. And as you'll notice, it's all over the East Coast. Don't pay attention to the observation in the Rocky Mountains. I already checked that one. It's actually misidentified. So I fixed that in the iNaturalist database already. Um, but you'll notice there is a group of reliably identified observations in Southeast Arizona, as well as the mountain ranges of Mexico leading up to the United States border, the Sierra Madre Oriental, the Eastern one, as well as the Sierra Madre Occidental, the Western one that leads up to Arizona. This is Euterboletus frostii or Exudoporus frostii. This amazing candy apple red fish netted bolete um, that absolutely has never been recorded in California and probably never will be, um, but it's associated with oaks all across the Eastern zone, as well as the Mexican oaks, um, as well as the Sky Islands of Southeast Arizona. So it's an amazing species that you would never expect to see in California. And yet one state over, just across the border, there it is. This is a surprising distribution, but it makes sense when you understand that this whole area used to be one contiguous forest of oaks in cooler, wetter periods in, in ancient um, biogeographic history. So in deep time, um, before sort of modern human civilization, before the current climatic regime that we're familiar with, there was a more extensive, more contiguous connected oak forest all across the east, down through Texas into Mexico and even into Arizona. But in recent times, the climate has dried out, has become warmer, and a lot of that oak zone got thinner and thinner and died out. And so what we see in Arizona is not so much um, mushrooms dispersing to the Sky Islands, but rather mushrooms that remain in the Sky Islands, even though the area around them is becoming less and less hospitable to them. So it's kind of their last foothold, their last stronghold in a place that is no longer um, as easy to live in as it used to be. And this is the story for a lot of mushrooms in Southeast Arizona. Um, I know Sigrid is in the meeting tonight. Um, maybe Michelle is as well, but Sigrid is one of the students in um, the Mushrooms of the Sky Island class that I taught through the Chiricahua Field Station um, run by the American Museum of Natural History a couple summers ago. We haven't been able to do it in the last two summers because of COVID, but we're hoping to get it started again. It will be taught in August if we do. August or early September, um, when the monsoons rain uh, in the mountains of Southeast Arizona. We all gathered there for a week or nine days 
And uh, Sigrid was, can tell you sort of all of the mushrooms that we found in the oak forest, the pine forest, and even in the taller or the higher elevations, um, there's actually fir as well. And if you go at the very highest elevations, there's even spruce and aspen. So it really doesn't feel like you're in Arizona when you're in what, for all intents and purposes, is a disjunct of the Rocky Mountains or the Mexican Sierra Madre. So here's an example of some of the amazing diversity of boletes that you find in the Sky Island. Many of these are species that you're familiar with from the East Coast. Down at the bottom right-hand corner is Boletellus rosellii, growing right next to an agave. In the middle is uh, something very similar to Boletus variopes, growing right next to a cactus. Um, bottom left is Tylopolis plumbio violaceus, that beautiful purple, purple and gray bolete that you find uh, all over the East Coast, but only grows in Southeast Arizona in any of the Western states. Um, up at the top right, some of you know the old man of the woods bolete, Strobilomyces. Very, very common mushroom all over the East, but very rare in the West, except for in Arizona. So the story repeats over and over. There are many clues that we can um, use to build this picture of what the ancient world looked like in the American West. It really tells a story of a different time. Um, now, the middle right there, that bright yellow poured bully, is actually not one that's shared with the East. That is an endemic to the Sky Islands of the extreme Southeast uh, corner of Arizona. That's Boletus holoxanthus. Um, it was described by a friend of mine, Bob Chapman, or I guess he's supplied the specimens to the Bessettes. Some of you may know Alan and Arlene Bessette, um, but it is a species you expect to see only in the Sky Islands. So there are definitely some endemic species that we've established for this uh, unique and really special habitat. Um, and to close out tonight, I just, I just want to point out that all of these habitat zones of North America, to some degree, can be considered islands of one form or another. Some of them have blurry boundaries. They're not like a real island in, in the ocean, but some of them are so distinctive in terms of their habitat associations, in terms of the temperature and rainfall patterns that they get, that they do result in really distinctive mushroom flora. Um, so if you go to Miami and draw a line through the tip of Florida going through Miami, 40% of the polypores that have ever been recorded in the United States only occur below that line. Because it's so subtropical, there's nowhere else in the United States that can support them. So there are islands that are landlocked, um, that aren't visible. Sky islands and dry islands, those in the ocean, are both quite obvious, even to our senses, but there, from a mushroom's perspective, there are places that are islands for reasons that are much less clear to us. And as we get to know the country better, as we build more and more knowledge of the biodiversity of fungi in North America, through the use of community science platforms, we're going to start to get clued into what some of these special areas are um, that contribute so much of the character of North America's mycoflora. And then it will be our, our task to conserve them and to get to know them better and to protect them because they all almost certainly will be facing great changes in the coming decades. Um, so that's about all I have to say tonight. And um, I wanna have some time for you to ask questions. So thanks you all for coming. Uh, um, and I hope to see you at an in-person mushroom fair next year. So Dan, you can read um, questions out of the chat or folks can- You have a question out of the chat. Uh, let's see, am I unmuted and on here? Sorry about that. I got my computer crossed up. Uh, I believe uh, uh, Felix Derossen had a question. Uh, maybe he'd like to unmute and ask it directly. Are you there, Felix? Uh, yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, no, I was, um, when you were talking about, uh, when you were wondering whether, I forget the name, whether this one species on the Channel Islands was a distinct species from its relative on the mainland. I was wondering, um, and this might be a very novice question, but how would you actually test that? And where, um, you know, the classical definition of a species in, in animal biology is, you know, and it's blurry, obviously, but like things that can, um, per, that can um, have offspring together. How does that boundary get defined with, with fungi? 
That's a really good question. It's not a novice question, or if it is, it's a good novice question. Um, the answer is, like you said, most easily resolved with DNA sequencing. Um, but that's not a perfect way to test this question. Um, a DNA sequence only tells you what it tells you, which is how many nucleotides differ between two samples. But what does that mean is up to you to decide, um, up to you to interpret. What if it's only a little different? What if it's consistently, but very marginally different? How do you interpret that? Um, and then you have to line it up with other pieces of evidence. Is there any morphological divergence? Is there any ecological divergence? Um, so it's not clear that any individual line of evidence is sufficient, but by combining multiple lines of evidence together, we can sort of build a more compelling or more convincing argument for why something is a species uh, or not. Um, and it, it is always good to remember that species do not exist in any objective way in nature. They are human constructs that we use to communicate more effectively. Organisms are always changing over time. So even a species one century will be different from a species a millennium um, down the road. Gene flow changes, morphology changes, ecology changes. Um, there are no static genetic lineages. Thank you. So, so I guess what you're saying is that uh, if two species are different enough that they cannot mate for physical reasons or for geographical reasons or whatever, eventually you expect to get multiple species. Yeah, so I could go into a, a longer discussion of, yeah. of species concepts, but it's so subtle and complicated that it would have yeah. to be another lecture. But yeah. basically there's, very, there's not a lot of easy ways to directly test the biological species concept, which is based on yeah. mating compatibility. That's kind of difficult for most fungi. Um, and we use DNA sequencing as a stand-in to approximate the same sort of results. Okay. See, any other uh, questions from the group? Feel free to unmute and throw in some comments. Hmm. I think we're all just kind of mind blown because that was amazing. <laughs> And a lot of it was also very disturbing, the humanity part. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, the good news is that um, there is a lot of interest in conservation and rehabilitation of the islands. Um, so even the current Navy islands are have full-time bio biologists living on island all the time. Um, there are conservation teams that ensure that the existing sort of still existing biodiversity of San Nicolas and um, especially San Clemente is going to continue to persist there. So at least the Navy is doing its diligence now to keep um, both the animals, the plants, fungi, they don't really have as much of an eye towards yet, but you know, we'll get there eventually, hopefully. Um, the islands have a much brighter future than actually even a lot of mainland habitats because they are much easier to manage because they are discrete entities you have a better chance of preventing um, certain kinds of invasions from happening on islands than you do on the mainland where there's just constant exchange of sort of human propagules and, and commercial traffic. Um, so the islands in some ways are more likely to have a better future than a lot of mainland habitats. Um, the Santa Cruz Island Fox or even the Island Foxes, the general story are an example of, of how, how much more control you have over conservation on an island than you do on the mainland. So uh, island foxes were in pretty bad way for a while um, because golden eagles had moved in uh, in the absence of bald eagles, which had collapsed because of DDT. So bald eagles eat fish, fish bioaccumulate DDT, bald eagles were dying off on the Channel Islands and golden eagles were moving in to fill that vacant niche um, golden eagles don't eat fish, they eat mammals. And so they were eating a lot of the island foxes and the island foxes were having a very hard time um, keeping their populations up. There was a huge effort to remove the golden eagles, relocate them back to the Sierra Nevada, um, quell the use of DDT, 
allow for bald eagle populations to come back. Vegetation regrew after the grazing animals were exterminated on the islands. They were finally removed from all of the national park islands. Um, and the foxes rebounded in a big way. So huge success story um, that would have been probably vastly more difficult were it to occur on the mainland. That's fantastic. Thank you again. So Joanne, because you're here, do you want to add anything? You're you're another island mycologist. Tell us about your experience on Santa Cruz. We've been out to Santa Cruz. Thank you, Christian. Sure. We've been out to Santa Cruz, I don't know, about four times for four or five days each. And uh, hopefully we'll get out again this month or early next month because the rain's been so good. Um, we've focused on both the uh, oak and the, well, all the habitats. And each time we've been out there, we've found probably about 80% new fungi, new species. And uh, we've got about a hundred of them now out for DNA barcoding. So we'll see what the names really are, but we are, we're hardly reproduce or replicating what we've seen in the past, which means we're just at the beginning of a study. And between you and us and five others, it'll take us a decade. <laughs> at least. To yeah. find them all. Yeah. And, and Joanne, I want to ask you, have you considered going out to Catalina to try and start documenting in those oak forests? No, I'd much rather spend time on Miguel Rosa and Anacapa, to be honest, where we have seen fungi and all. Um, the two times or three or four times I've been out on San Nick and San Clemente, we weren't allowed to collect. You know, we didn't have the permission you had on Miguel. So we weren't allowed to collect or do any real photography, which just made me cry because we saw a lot. <laughs> uh. That's heartbreaking. I, I think I'll focus on the four northern ones. There's more than my lifetime to do out there. That's true. But I want to encourage anyone, because I know a lot of people do go to Catalina because it's sort of a tourist attraction. They have some amazing um, oak as well as cottonwood. Mm -hmm. um, there's even cottonwoods that live out there. So there's a whole set of fungi that probably don't exist on the other islands. Um, so if you do go out there, please do make sure to observe and share everything you see. Catalina, I think, has the potential to be one of the richest islands for fungi. Also, this on the sand, you know, the the where plants have edged their way into the sand on the coast, we've found fungi. And I bet on Catalina there'd be even more. We do a lot of camping by kayak on the islands. Wow. So we spend wow. a lot of time out there on the on the real coast. That's but awesome. we find fungi right there too. That's in, amazing. The dunes. Yeah. Now they've got me interested. <laughs> Thank you for that, Joanne. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Any other questions? Mushrooms with Quercus pacifica. Um, probably. Um, that, that's the best answer I can give. I haven't been in a grove of Quercus pacifica while it's fruiting really well. But I mean, any Quercus is, is basically one of the best genera of, of plants for mycorrhizal fungi. So there virtually has to be. Um, it would be far more surprising if there weren't mushrooms with, with Quercus pacifica, but I haven't caught them yet. It's um, one of the annoying things about the islands is, is not being able to snap your fingers and be there when you want to. Hmm. There used to be a little um, uh, private company that would fly out um, to the islands, but they, I guess, quit running. Um, so you can only take a boat out to most of the Northern Islands now. We have been out a couple times in August and September, a number of times in August and September, because it's a calm time for the water to kayak out there. And we've found a surprising amount under the Quercus tomentella, for example, on Santa Rosa and in August and September. That That's just really doesn't cool. happen to be a time that you or we probably go out now. Yeah. Because it's low season. Yeah. But it's worth it. I, we want to do that. It, again, only for fungi, it's worth it. Plus you get to snorkel in that beautiful water. For many hours. And to the offshore rocks. Actually, we've never collected on the offshore rocks. Uh, Santa Barbara Island has a fabulous opportunity in the... Uh, 
Coriopsis to look on the offshore two big islands off the island of Santa Barbara. That would be fun one day. Yeah, because there are the, so actually one of the biggest challenges um, to knowing the islands thoroughly will be West Anacapa. So the problem with West Anacapa is that there is a perennial sort of, or not perennial, but it's a wintertime breeding population of pelicans that no one is allowed to disturb. But West Anacapa has these ectomycorrhizal shrubs that the other part of Anacapa doesn't. So if you want to know Anacapa Islands from a fungal perspective, you're gonna to have to figure out how to get in amongst those pelicans during the winter. Very unlikely that we'll be get, getting permission anytime soon, but the botanists have gotten permission occasionally. So there's still hope. So someday we may be able to twist some arms and get out there. Well, they've been able to climb the cliffs. Right. And just like the Hawaiian plant surveys. And that would also be really good for the fungi. Yep. Thank you, Christian. Sure. Okay, so it's now 8.40. If there's not any more questions, I think it's about time to let you all go. But before we do, there's one thing you need to do, Christian. Yeah. Which is uh, introduce I have a question. Uh, speakers for the other nights. Oh, go ahead, Felix. Is that Felix? So, yeah, since, since there's no other questions, I will ask one more. Um, you mentioned uh, that... Um, Basically, my question, my question has to do with whether there is in the fungal world a similar debate around native versus non-native plants, uh, native versus non-native species as there is in the plant world. Um, if, if, if fungi are not everywhere around the world and that they are kind of, they, they do uh, uh, um, they, they, they aren't universally present. The species aren't universally di distributed everywhere on the planet. Um, are there uh, some fungi that are considered more native than others? And so is there kind of a debate around protecting certain species more than others? It's kind of a weird question. The, it's not as well developed in, in mushrooms as it is in plants, because in plants there is a very obvious pattern. So David Greenberger, who's in the, the talk tonight, um, is really the expert on this. But in California, there's, you know, I don't know, tens of thousands or 10,000 approximately the order of, of native or of vascular plants, but like some fraction, like 2000 of those are not native. I think that is that right, David, approximately. Um, so it's a big chunk of the um, big chunk of the diversity of plants in California that are not native. That is not the case with fungi. Um, we don't know of probably more than a dozen mushrooms that have a chance of being classified as invasive. Um, so it's a much lower percentage of the diversity of fungi um, that are considered to be non-native or invasive in any way. So death caps are an example of this. Um, there is virtually zero attention paid to attempts to control or mitigate the expansion of death caps. Um, that's about where the debate ends. There's really virtually no attention paid to it. I have a question. Oh, go for it. Okay. I put it in the chat. So I've been wandering around lots of, the, of North America, Central America, and picking up mushrooms here and there. But when it comes to identifying now, uh, if I don't have a DNA kit with me, what can I <laughs> hope to be able to carry with me, i.e. in my head, and deal with 500 species or 300 species? Well, you don't really have to. Um, if you want to, uh, that's sort of the kind of project that people like me and Phil try and memorize tons and tons of species um, and become familiar with them. But it's certainly not something that you have to do in order to contribute to this. You may only be familiar with a couple hundred or 100 or 10. Um, that's totally fine because what the iNaturalist Community Science Platform allows you to do is to observe naively 
you can just make observations of what you're seeing. And if you know what it is, great. And if you don't, that's what the community is for. That's what sharing with us is supposed to do. We will help fill in those memory gaps. We will help fill in for things that you've never seen before that you shouldn't expect to know. Um, that is sort of, there's more tools to uh, externalize that knowledge and carry it around with you than there ever have been in the past. So you have more helping tools for remembering all those names than have ever been available. You've got um, iNaturalist as one option. You also have sort of downloadable PDFs or checklists of names for what's been found. The publication that I'm working on for Channel Islands Macrofungi will serve partly that purpose is to sort of list systematically the names of all fungi for which there are bona fide documented records on the islands. So you could carry that with you and say, oh, I think it might be one of these 10 things that is known to occur on the islands. Um, maybe you know it's an Amanita. So that would give you your 10 or 12 Amanita options. Um, so that sort of narrows the range of things you have to remember, if that makes sense. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, uh, but no, a continuation with it. So I have, say, three mushroom books. Started with the uh, Canadian government's mushroom book in the 60s which was totally impossible because unless you could look at the spores with microscope, you couldn't use a book to identify much. Um, am I now totally antiquated that this sort of wandering naturalist with my three or four books is hopelessly limited in what I can identify? No, I don't think so at all. I mean, I started as the wandering naturalist with three or four books. And largely, I still am. Um, as long as you share what you're finding, you will have a chance of contributing to this. So your goal is, is to find a way to integrate what you're seeing um, with the body of knowledge that we're building. If you use iNaturalist, that's one way to do it, but it's not the only way. Um, there are other ways to share. You can make specimens. You can voucher and deposit with the museum. Um, is that what you're asking? Well, that's half of it. The other half is for my own knowledge. So I'm out there collecting, say, in Northwestern British Columbia, uh, behind the coastal mountains where I've spent time over the last 30 years. And uh, well, there is the internet now, maybe, but in lots of places there aren't. And I have my three books, one of which you're quite familiar with. And um, I'm picking up things and I hopelessly unable to really identify them. Um, yeah, there's probably lots of stuff you're not going to be able to identify, but just okay. to give you a, a point of commiseration, I'm hopelessly uh, unable to identify lots of stuff I find here in Santa Cruz, even with uh -huh. the internet, even with the uh, benefit of being able to sequence a lot of what I collect. It doesn't mean I, I identify more than a, a small fraction of what I find. Oh, the, sta okay. the state of knowledge is the problem, not you. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> and I noticed a few more questions hidden in the chat that I had missed. People are directing them to me. And they should direct, if you have chat questions, you should direct them to Christian or to the whole group. Uh, but somebody asked, uh, let's see, uh, is there a relation between the Channel Island oyster mushroom and the New Zealand oyster? Is it a divergent or convergent relationship. I'm not sure if you established the relationship, but... Yeah, we don't know. Um, they clearly share a very recent common ancestor. Um, so they are in the same clade. So they, they, they are not just convergent morphologically. They do share a recent ancestor. Okay. And another question, somebody reminded me if the group chat may be turned off. That's possible, although I did see at least one post to the group. Uh, let's see, there was a question uh, from Annie Weiss, whose children are asleep and can't ask this out loud. Uh, do islands and rivers also have endemic species or are they usually just extensions of the land around them? Islands, say, say that again? Islands and rivers. Oh, in rivers. Well, yeah. if you study the Amazon, any ornithologist will tell you there's lots of interesting river island endemics. Um, that's all I can say about that. I don't yeah. know much about river islands. Yeah, fact, I guess it would just have to be a persistent island. 
Yeah, if it lasts long enough, and if it's got a different enough habitat associated with it, a floodplain island, um, then it can it can totally cause divergence in the organisms that live there. Okay. Uh, let's see. I don't think I see any other questions. Uh, the audience. Uh, there were a few things on the YouTube group, but they were not related to, uh, they were not pertinent <laughs> to the talk. Uh, so when is the best time to mushroom hunt in Arizona? Whenever it's rained enough, um, which is usually August, late August. Okay, thanks. Wow. But some, some years it doesn't happen. Um, two years ago, there was virtually no monsoon. Last year, there was an excellent monsoon. So it it really depends on watching the weather. Yeah, so you really have to travel on the go, Dan. Yeah, you, I mean, you kind of have to block off the entire month and then just pack a bag and keep it by the door. Okay. Okay. So we say something about tomorrow night's talk or the talks or the rest of the week? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know how much value there is in me um, saying them all. You can yeah. see all of the descriptions. Um, I can't remember all of the details of what people are talking about, but you can read them all on the website. Um, I'll put the link in the chat here. Okay. Yeah, so we, we do have some folks, though, that I, I should mention. So um, some of you know Maria Moro, who I have co-taught um, a lot of things with a webinar. Um, I've led some walks for Backcountry Press. She'll be on Friday, Adventures of a Micro Microcosmonaut. I'm really looking forward to that one. Um, Luca Hickey is going to be talking about the differences between coast redwood and cedar, Pacific Northwest cedar forests. Um, both members of the same uh, family, these two trees, but with different uh, fungal assemblages beneath them. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, we have Chris Hobbs talking about medicinal mushrooms and then Danny Miller talking about the revolution that DNA sequencing has sort of not just given to mushrooms, but sort of disrupted uh, the study of mushrooms. Um, so Danny is going to be talking, I believe, on is he Wednesday? See, this is why I didn't want to try and guess at all of this. Oh, well, let me uh, let me just share this and we can just, okay, let's see. Yeah, Danny's on Thursday, sorry. Oh, yeah, there we go. Maria's on Friday, Luca is speaking on Wednesday, and Chris is speaking tomorrow night. Yeah, so there it is. Uh, Chris Hobbs, Mushroom Medicine, latest news and products. Often mysterious fungal relationships in different habitats. I don't know if that's a correct title or not. I, I made that up based on the description. Uh, but I think it's close. Uh, DNA for dummies. I, I'll have to turn in for that one. And Adventures of a Micro Cosmonaut. This looks a little funny on a, on a funny screen. Make the screen there you go. Better. Oh. I can make this a lot better. There we go. Anyhow, so yeah. you, those are all at the same time, same link as, as tonight. Um, yeah. And you can also tune into YouTube to watch them. These are all people, almost all people I've met, except for Luca. I've not met Luca. I'm really looking forward to seeing their talk, though. All right. All right. Thanks for tuning in tonight, everybody. Have a good evening. Stay healthy. Stay safe. Thank you, Christian. Bye, Good night, all. Night. Bye, everybody. Bye, Thank Sigrid. You. Great talk, Christian. Bye, Mandy. Yeah. Bye, Phil. Very good. Yeah, take Claire. care. Oh, Bye. I see how many names I recognize. Bye, Bill. Bye, Brennan. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, I actually see a lot of names from this week's foray. Good. So, anyhow, I'll see you guys tonight. Let me 